Hey, yo, welcome everyone to episode 36 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this week we're going to speak to the owner of Arcade Galactic and Arcade Heroes blog, Adam. Welcome, Adam. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Joe. I appreciate that. Yeah, we've been talking a little bit back and forth. Um, I know you run Arcade Heroes, which is an awesome blog focused on, seems like primarily arcade stuff, but there's definitely some other kind of indie stuff that falls in there too. And right before we jump into everything, I just want to remind everyone um, to subscribe, like, follow, share the podcast or the video, wherever you're watching. Um, It means the world to us. We really appreciate your support um, and we'll keep these episodes coming for you every week. I want you to just kind of let everybody know a little bit about yourself and how you kind of got into what you're doing. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I've uh, been a gamer as long as I can remember. Uh, When I was, I think, two years old, my parents got a Texas Instruments uh, 99.4A computer, and that started the addiction for me. (laughs) Um, Didn't get to visit a lot of of arcades growing up, but the first time that I did, I think I was about six or seven, um, it really left an impression on me because I already loved video games. And then finding a place that was jam-packed with all these cool video games that were uh, better and bigger and flashier than anything I'd ever seen at home just uh, really stuck with me. And... Not long, it was at that first arcade visit that I came across a game called Discs of Tron, and I didn't know what Tron was because the movie came out the year I was born. And uh, but that had me look for it, and I think it was a few years until I came across it on TV. Um, back when we would have TV or movies on TV <laughs> on regular over the air TV, and uh just watching that something in that stuck with me with uh, the Kevin Flynn character, this guy who made his own video games living inside of his own arcade. And I thought that would be the coolest thing to do. And so for the longest time, I thought I would do just that. I would build my own arcade building and live in an apartment uh, above it and make video games and and all that. But things didn't quite shake out (laughs) like that. But, um, I just I always had a, a thing for arcades as I could come across them. I did work for one when I was a teenager, and so that's where I got most of my exposure uh, to arcades from. Was um, uh, working in the late '90s, early 2000s arcade, and of course that was about the time where there was a, a crash of the market. But uh, just that really solidified for me that I wanted to do something in the arcade industry and then years later 2008 is when i finally got things together and created my own arcade which was originally called game grid arcade Um, obviously influenced from tron but it was actually last year before the pandemic started that uh, some guy from a company that sells cards uh, they called their business game grid um and I, I think I had registered at first, but they grew really fast and had all these locations and made millions of dollars. And so they were basically threatening me legally to take me to court if I didn't change my name. And so uh, I had to change the name to Arcade Galactic. Um, and so that, that was a lot of fun. But I've also been doing the blog work because I really enjoy writing. I've always uh, enjoyed that. And I submitted some articles, reviews of arcade games to Hardcore Gamer Magazine, I think back in 2006, and I was always scouring the internet looking for arcade news because almost nobody was talking about it, and um, then this blog appeared one day called Arcade Heroes, and that was just perfect for me, and I started submitting news, and then they they asked me, hey, do you want to write for this site? And that was about April 2007, and I just started writing all these articles and posting every bit of news that I could find. And uh, eventually, the other writers just stopped writing for it. And the guy who originally founded the website contacted me and said, Hey, do you want to become the owner of the site? And this was like 2010, I think. I said, Sure. <laughs> and so uh, he transferred ownership over to me. And I've just been doing that ever since while I do the arcade 
That's really cool. I like that uh, you knew from a very young age that this is what you wanted to do and you just kind of set out and made it happen. Yeah. Um, along with that, I was going to ask what came first, the arcade or the blog, but you kind of already answered that. And <laughs> the whole the whole idea of you just wanting to write news and kind of inform people about it. Um, do you have any idea about how many stories you've written at this point? Like if you had to guess. Oh, um, I could probably find out if I pulled up the blog and saw how many posts I've it says are under my name. But last time I think I checked, it was somewhere about close to 4,000. That's a lot of articles. So yeah. you've, been, <laughs> you, you've been spreading the news about uh, the arcade for quite some time. Yeah. Um, and I just want to know, um, there's one that you've been posting about a lot that I've been interested in. That's XR Arcadia. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think of this new system? Is it is it like a new version of the Neo Geo? Do you think it's going to be a lot better than the Neo Geo? Like, what's what's your stance on it? Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, that that to me, the as soon as I was contacted by the uh, CEO of the company, um, and he explained what it was, I immediately saw that there is a lot of potential here. Now, of course, it's a really tough thing to sell a platform like that in today's market because most of the arcades these days want to be big experiences very expensive experiences where they you know they're these huge cabinets like you see with the halo fire team raven or house of the yeah, dead all, all the raw thrill stuff yeah basically. yeah and they the games have just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger from where they used to be and so that has um that, that's just been the trend. And so seeing this platform, it's like, wow, this could have the potential to really shake up the industry uh, because uh, like a lot of people don't know this, but uh, I also used to sell arcade machines for several years and uh, I sold them all over the world. And the average price of an arcade machine is somewhere around $7,500, but that's been ticking up with all of these really expensive stuff. And so seeing this new platform come along and promise to be much cheaper i think it's somewhere around two to three thousand dollars for the uh, computer system itself and then the game cartridges um, are also uh, somewhere between 1200 to 15 maybe two thousand dollars depending on the game um it's like yeah this could be the the modern neo geo because uh, i mean for anybody that knows the Neo Geo already, you you know the story. If you're not terribly familiar with it, then, well, it really gave a boost to arcades throughout the 90s because it allowed a lot of uh, places to get games for cheap. And it was very popular in Latin America. And I, I didn't know this until I opened the ar- arcade, but uh, in Latin America, from Mexico down to Argentina, uh, I mean... They didn't know Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat and Virtua Fighter. They knew King of Fighters because it was so easy to find a Neo Geo system um, in pretty much anywhere uh, down there in the 90s. Um, But yeah, I think this has the potential to do that. And while some people have criticized them because a lot of the games are um, adapted ports from existing indie games on Steam, and a um, few mobile games here and there. Um, it, it's like, well, it, it's not an easy or cheap thing to launch a platform. It's not just simply selling a computer with uh, with with cartridges. I mean, they had to. They did do a customized motherboard. Um, they did do a custom customized cartridges. All that stuff takes money, and then it takes money to get developers on board. Um, it was uh, back in 2015, there was a small team out of Indiana called Griffin Aerotech. I believe you've um, talked with them before. Or yep, I spoke them? with uh, Chris, their, their artist. We talked yeah. about uh, Sky Cursor and a little bit about the Enter the Gungeon game, which is still still in the works. Right, right. And so like they, they were one case where they did attempt to launch a JAMA-based arcade system. They, they called it Airframe. Uh, but it only supported one game at a time. Um, instead of cartridges, they used USB sticks. I, I did own Sky Cursor for a few years. 
Um, but uh, they, unfortunately, they just weren't able to get a lot more developers on board. And so it, I think it only it had Sky Cursor. It had one called Rashlander. I know they had a few other games that were in the works, but uh, I'm not sure whatever happened with those. But for X Arcadia, you know, they launched in Japan at the very end of 2019. And as of right now, they already have, I think it's about 12 games available for it. You know, that that's a really impressive feat for a newcomer to come along and be able to do that, to convince developers to adapt their games for their platform. And I, I do know of some things going on behind the scenes with the X Arcadia that I'm not at liberty to uh, state publicly, um, but they do have some very big names in the works coming along. And so, again, where they've been criticized for uh, not having a lot of big names, like they don't have Street Fighter or Tekken or, or stuff like that, uh, they will be getting bigger names, but a lot of people need to realize that to get to that point where big companies like that will talk to you, you know, you need to show that you can be successful. And I think they have been, uh, particularly in Japan, uh, where they're primarily based, is uh, they've been able to get a lot of operators on board over there. And that that's a huge deal um, that, that turned a lot of heads for them to be able to do that because Taito and Sega essentially have owned the market over there, or Square Enix, I guess. And for uh, somebody that had no name or history to come along and and basically dominate in the market uh, to some degree um, that that's really impressive and another thing that a lot of people don't know about the Japanese market and why the EXA is really um, seen as a, a boon to the market there is that probably since 2009-2010 uh, most arcade developers there require what's called a revenue share. So it, me, if I was in Tokyo and I was wanting to buy a new arcade machine, I would have to pay for the machine uh, and anything else. But then I have to have my machine connected to the internet and then I have to pay part of the revenues to the developer. So it's a continual thing. It's great for the developers because they're still making money after they've initially sold the hardware, but it really sucks for the operators because, you know, they have a lot of costs already. I mean, these games are extremely expensive, especially in Japan. And then you have rent, you have wages, you have taxes, insurance, maintenance, uh, all that other stuff. And then the developers are taking a cut and sometimes it's a big cut like 40 percent of what your machine makes is going to namco or or taito or sega and so the exa is the first machine in about a decade to come along and say you can buy this and then you own the game and you keep all the revenues and so that's why so i i know they've sold over 200 units there already just in japan alone and and the it's why a lot of developers have jumped on board because it's like, or sorry, operators, um, because it's like, hey, I finally can keep some revenue and that can help me stay open because, you know, that there's been plenty of news out there of, of arcades closing in Japan and, and the market shrinking there. And a lot of it's because of that revenue share model. And, and so... For Japan, that's, uh, I mean, it's still great for U.S. operators, too. We fortunately don't have very many games that require a revenue share of some kind like that. But uh, that's one of the biggest shakeup style changes that exist out there. Yeah, I mean, that's that's absolutely massive. When you're talking about buying, I mean, like you said, the average arcade cabinet can cost in $7,000 in that range. Mm -hmm. And when you convert that to yen, that's a lot more money. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're you're talking taking half of the money your cabinet makes over the course of a month and putting it back to the company that you already spent $7,000 with. So I totally get that. And even here selling indie games, it's, it's a pitch just getting $6,000 into an arcade and saying right. you get to keep all the profits forever. Like we will never come back and ask you for more money. Yeah. Um, I think that's really cool with uh, XR Arcadia and what they're doing. And it, it makes perfect sense as to why they're doing so well in Japan. 
Um, I'm curious as to what you think. I know you've covered it a little bit here and there. You've covered some of the indie games here. Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think of the American indie scene? Uh, What games do you think are the most promising and what hopes do you have for the future from indie producers? It's a good question uh, because that I would say there wasn't the first indie game I ever remember covering. It was back in uh, maybe maybe 2007. It's called Get Out of My Face. Uh, unfortunately, I never got a chance to play it, but um, uh, that that was where the scene really started to come into being. Uh, most people think of Killer Queen Arcade, but um, but it really started with that Get Out of My Face game. And um, now, of course, Killer Queen is the one that's really um, pushed the the indie scene into becoming something that's i guess you could call it sustainable and uh, especially where the the u.s market over the past decade or so has been focused uh, there there's two different segments of it i guess you could say uh one primary segment is the fec market which is uh, family entertainment centers like dave and busters round one usa and boomers and others uh, main event and then you have the bar arcade market and that that one has just exploded. It's just there haven't been a lot of games that the big guys make that really work for the bar scene. You know, that maybe Golden Tee, Big Buck Hunter, uh, Pac-Man Battle Royale, but it, but it hasn't been much. And so a lot of the bar arcades have generally focused more on old games from the 80s and 90s. Yeah, most uh, of them are going for that kind of throwback retro right, vibe. So they right. want games that, that fit that. Right. And that's where I think indies, um, they really fill in that that need. Because, uh, I mean, of course, the problem we have with bars is a lot of them don't want to pay the prices for a brand new arcade machine. They don't want to pay several thousand dollars, especially when most of their games are only a few hundred bucks. Right. Um, but with as I've discovered with my own business is that the games that make the money are the new ones something fresh something that people haven't seen before but at the same time the challenge with indie games because i i've owned several or i own several right now um at the moment i have uh, re-rave which was by step revolution i have cosmotrons by arcadeaholics i have death stalker by um uh, galloping ghost uh, i have one that I think only two of them exist uh, called JPO and SLC, which was made by a, an artist here locally. <laughs> um, not sure if you've heard of that one or not. I have not heard of that one. Uh, yeah. He, he only made like two of them and he taught himself how to make a game and he made a, a shoot 'em up game. That's uh, about the indie uh, music scene in Salt Lake city. <laughs> so very, very local, <laughs> very esoteric, but um uh, I have one of those here, and I, I guess it's the challenge with indie games is that they don't have a name attached to them that a lot of people know, and so the challenge has been people will see it and they'll notice that well the the cabinet looks new but the game looks old and I've never heard of it before so some people will just keep walking, uh, whereas others will be like oh this is interesting and different so let me try it. And so it's it's always about trying to figure out how do you how you draw those people in, um, and then of course you need gameplay that's easy to understand and intuitive. Because the more explanation that it takes, the harder it is for people to really get into it. And you can't have an attendant sitting there all the time telling people how to play. But I know with Killer Queen, um, they to be honest, I think they got kind of got lucky in that regard where. Um, a scene of people just started showing up where they were organizing, they were teaching people how to play or, or dragging people in to, and say, hey, come and try this game out. And th- this is what you do. This is how you, you do it. And, and that helped grow the scene. And I would say out of everything that I've seen out there over the years, Killer Queen's definitely the most successful indie game. Uh, yeah, without a doubt, they have an absolutely massive community. Yeah, yeah, and and in a way, that's kind of what a lot of indies need to be able to really thrive. Uh, but it's really difficult to be able to get that. But I think the multiplayer aspect of it, 
uh, which is something that most indie games do have. Um, right? Like I know Galactic Battleground does, and as well as uh, almost all of those other games that I mentioned. Yeah, I'm thinking the only one that doesn't is Black Emperor, and that's just because it's a single-player game. Right, right, which I did like. Uh, I, I thought that was interesting and very fun, but I, I doubt that it has as much uh, uh, in enthusiasm behind it as Killer Queen has been able to manage. I, I know there are some, some diehard pockets. There are some areas right. in the country that, like, some arcades that absolutely, absolutely love it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's kind of just uh, where you place it, just kind of see how it goes, I guess. Right, right. Yeah, and, and that's definitely the, the challenge is because with, uh, with the way that the market set up is a lot of these games, if you put them into an FEC like Dave and Buster's, they won't get played uh, or they might get played a little bit, but they won't get played as much as like the ticket redemption games and the ski ball and the crane machines. And uh, unfortunately most operators, all they look at is how much a game makes. And uh, so even if you have the funnest game that's ever been developed, but if it doesn't make any money, then either they wouldn't buy it in the first place because it wouldn't show the earnings or they would sell it off pretty fast and and so that's unfortunately just kind of the reality of how the market works um and so it's i think it's up to indie developers to also test their games out in fecs and maybe take feedback to make adjustments that might make them a little bit more uh, easy to approach for the casual player right yeah i mean that's definitely a good point um I'm kind of looking at the blog, uh, Arcade Heroes, and I'm mm-hmm. curious as to um, where has Arcade Heroes taken you by means of like conventions and traveling, and what are some of the memories from conventions that really stick with you? Wow, yeah, that's a good question. So um, the very first trade show I went to was 2008. Um, it was... I don't think it was called Amusement Expo at the time, but um, it, in the business, it's often been called the AMOA show or the spring show, and it always would happen in March or so. And, and this year is actually the first year that they've never that they've not done it in in March. Right now, I think it's the end of June, but um, happened in Las Vegas. Uh, I actually, since I'm in Salt Lake City, I was thinking, well, um, I'm, I'm doing the blog work. I really want to go to a trade show because in the arcade business, oftentimes that's where all the news is or at these shows. It's when you get brand new games. But th- this industry, it, it's kind of frustrating because a lot of the manufacturers of games don't like to talk about their games. <laughs> it's like pulling teeth. And you, you have to go there in person and see the game to really get any information about it. And so um, it, it was really essential to go to a trade show. And so we, we drove down to Las Vegas, my brother and I, and uh, checked that out. And that was um, really interesting. I actually interviewed the head of uh, Bandai Namco Amusements America, um, I think that was the first interview I ever did <laughs> uh, with with somebody, and um, that that was interesting. Pretty um, big name in the industry too. Yeah, yeah. Had to be um, a little nerve wracking. Yeah, it was because I I don't think I was very well prepared <laughs> with a lot of questions. I just kind of met him and and I told him who I was, and he knew who I was because of the blog, and and that's always been the kind of an odd thing for me uh, is I'll, I'll go to these trade shows and you know, somebody at random will see the badge and they'll just see arcade heroes on there and be like, Oh, Hey, you're, our, you're, you're the arcade hero guy. Uh, and it's like, yeah. And they'll tell me, you know, they like reading the blog or that it's almost like they know more about me than I know about them. And that always feels a little awkward. Um, <laughs> when that happens, uh, but, but it was, it was also really cool. Cause, uh, I think it wasn't at that trade show, but the next year in 2009, the amusement expo, um, I was told by somebody at raw thrills, Hey, Eugene Jarvis wants to talk to you. And I was like, Oh, wow. Really? Um, uh, cause you know, I'd always read about Eugene and, uh, 
played his games, of course, but uh, hearing that he wanted to talk to to just an insignificant blogger, it's like, wow, that's... Uh... Yeah, he seeked you out. <laughs> right, right. It was, and... it was kind of, it's definitely cool to meet him. We met him in uh, Milwaukee, I think, in 2019 or 2018. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's such an easygoing guy, so easy to talk to, and... Uh, uh, and so, yeah, he's uh, he's always a lot of fun. And but he's also a little difficult when you're at these trade shows because he'll be talking with you, and then somebody will come up at random and say, "Hey, Eugene," and then he's off on another conversation. And <laughs> so he, he's a busy, busy guy. But uh, I, I've always enjoyed every time I've had a chance to talk with him, and it's always been at trade shows and, and just uh, hanging out with him. But uh, yeah, I mean. Talking with uh, the different uh, people that are behind the games has always been probably some of my best memories of going to these trade shows because uh, I've talked with people at uh, at the top of Sega and Raw Thrills, as mentioned, and Namco, as mentioned, uh, and other companies. And uh, it's, uh, it's always been really good to get the insight from from them in person as to, you know, why did you make this game? Um, what are the features behind it and, and all that? And, and to, of course, be able to, to play the games. Um, I'd say apart from those conversations, many of which are, are probably the strongest memories I have would be just walking a lot, <laughs> um, to, especially at IAPA. And so uh, if you're not familiar with IAPA, it's the it's like the E3 of the amusement industry, but I think it's bigger. I mean, it's just massive. And um, they did it in Las Vegas back in 2009, but since then it moved to Orlando and it's just always been in Orlando. But they literally fill out the entire Orange County Convention Center and they like to brag that it's like 10 miles worth of rows uh, that you can walk and but it, it's just it's crazy because it's just so massive and there's so much to see but there's also other cool things that aren't in the necessarily the arcade business but the theme park business that you get to see um that are just kind of fascinating like uh, uh i i think it was uh, when zip lines became a thing for a while they were that was introduced at iapa like portable zip lines that anybody could set up um, uh, inflatable climbing walls, <laughs> uh, brand new roller coasters that would show up at Disney world or sea world and, and stuff like that. And so just, just seeing the technology that pops up there. Um, and of course there, in recent years, um, seeing all the different virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality concepts. Um, it's always a lot of fun to, to give those a, a try and, see in person because especially some of those things you just like i never see them unless i'm at a trade show (laughs) right Uh, and uh, especially for how expensive some of them are um and so but it's yeah just overall i i love going to trade shows it it has sucked that the pandemic has made it so those haven't uh, been a thing but um yeah probably june or so is when we'll be able to go back to that. And that's, uh, of course, where I met you as well um, and when you guys t- brought Galactic Battleground to, uh, wasn't it Amusement Expo 2019, I think? Yep, it was uh, in Vegas. And then have you gone, you've gone to MGC as well, right? Actually, I haven't. So that, that's been the thing I've wanted to do. Um, it's just, it's always been difficult because since MGC is so soon, so close to Amusement Expo, usually my budget <laughs> only allows me to, to get to Vegas. And I've always enjoyed shows in Vegas because they're so close. Like I, I can either drive there or fly there for cheap. Uh, and, and so that's been an easy thing to do. IAPA's always been a little bit harder because it's a bit more of an expense and especially where it's longer. But I, I've wanted to get to MGC I've just not been able to fit it into my budget. But I did go to uh, California Extreme back in 2018. Um, I believe we were there. I I wasn't personally, but I know that our programmer, Kelly, did bring the game down, I believe, that year. Oh, okay. Um, I'm trying to remember. I might. I thought I saw everything there. I just can't remember seeing Galactic Battleground there or not. But, uh, 
But that that was actually an event where X Arcadia. That was the first trade show that they went to, and they had several games set up. And so that was the first time I got to really talk with those people in person. I actually interviewed the um, CEO of uh, that company there, and um, uh, but it, that was that was really cool because I was able to play so many games that I'd only read about over the years like iRobot uh, <laughs> or Thayer's Quest or all these other obscure, hard-to-find games and, uh, and everything. Just My kids got a little bored, unfortunately, because they couldn't find enough that they wanted to. But I was, you know, I was one of those staying up until 1 in the morning <laughs> playing games and, uh, and whatnot. So that, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's always how it goes at trade shows. You stay up way later than you mean to, especially when you go to ones that are 24-hour arcades. Like a lot of yeah. fighting game tournaments and stuff are just, they don't close. So right. you never have to leave. Right. Um, you got to take advantage of it. <laughs> You're right. paying You're for it. And so. <laughs> awesome. Well, I really enjoyed talking to you about all this stuff. Um, can you give shout outs to all your social media links so that people can find you um, so that they can check out Arcade Heroes and your arcade? Yeah, yeah, sure. So blog, of course, is ArcadeHeroes.com. Uh, the Arcade Business is ArcadeGalactic.com. And um, I'm on Facebook and Twitter under Arcade... Actually, let's see. Facebook, I think, is Arcade Hero. Yeah, Arcade Heroes had already been taken uh, by somebody. So it's Facebook.com slash Arcade Hero. Um, on Twitter, it's Arcade Heroes... Um, um, we've I've dabbled with uh, some of the alternate social media sites out there like MeWe, um, so you can find Arcade Heroes there. And I think I've set up an account on just about everything that was out there just to see if it would get the word out to uh, um, other people. But um, I think the parlor one doesn't exist anymore because they got shut down. Uh, but and then of course I'm on, I'm on YouTube um, under just search for arcade heroes and and i guess going back really quick to um, trade shows uh, uh, that's where i get a lot of my uh, new footage is uh, for you the youtube channel is uh, i always try to go to at least two trade shows a year and so i'll film the new games there and then put it up on youtube uh, with an explanation or something um, and then of course um, arcade galactic is also on facebook and twitter and youtube as well and so uh yeah, but uh, just feel free to check it out. And of course, with the pandemic, there hasn't been a lot of arcade news to discuss. Um, but it seems like it's starting to tick up again as more people are getting back into uh, the business. And uh, and I also am more than happy to cover indie games. I try and cover those as often as I find out about them. Just uh, there have been a game or two that I missed completely until... Uh, somebody mentioned it a couple of years later, like Death Ball. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if it's an art video arcade, I, I want to cover it. Awesome. Um, well, I'll throw those links in the description um, so you guys can check it out. If you like what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Um, it really helps us out a lot with spreading the word and talking about people like this. Um, again, Adam, thank you for coming on. And until okay. next time, peace. Peace.